Yeah, very cool. It's like very meditative. Like, uh, like it's a really cool guitar loop and um, gives it totally gives it a vibe. Vocal sound awesome. Yeah, <laughs> tell me a little bit about what went into making that song. Thank you. Um, so lots of vocal layers in this one. So um, I think there's probably six or seven layers um, of like a main and then like panned left and right and then like one vocal you know like a meter away from the mic another one maybe like two and a half meters away from the mic and then like a oh wow a little whisper track as well to give it a bit more air yeah so I I had a lot of fun with lots of vocal layers in this so yeah so that was really good and then I learned the importance actually of editing all the vocals so that everything is aligned because I guess when you have a lot of different vocal tracks things can sound a bit misaligned when all your you know t's aren't coming out at the same time and your s's are all over the place and all (laughs) that kind of thing so I think vocal editing for me is also the most tedious thing um really kind of getting into those and I, I like to um like manually DS my S's and stuff rather than using a DS a plugin and stuff. So then mm. it's like eight tracks times, you know, how many ever S's are in the song to like manually duck each one of those and, and things. So um, lots, lots of vocal editing in this one and lots of vocal parallel processing as well. So like different reverbs and delays and things, especially there's a, there's a section where it's like a, waterfall um track where there's like a a section of the song repeats and there's a few uh, extra harmonies and things added in there so i had to make sure that things had clarity um but then it still kind of lifts the track towards the end as well Mm. so but a bit of like eqing panning making thing making space for everything yeah yeah exactly so yeah panning panning was a a big part of it and and yeah i guess um like treating the mains and the the other um uh, vocal layers a little bit differently as well Mm, giving them like a different kind of sonic imprint yeah what what were those like effects that were you know you hear like coins i think on the sides of the ears on the on there were some cool like uh (laughs) like ear candy moments yeah, um, I don't know, actually. I, I probably had some random, like, uh, sample. Uh, knowing me, it was probably one long sample of random sounds and I just chopped it up and then put a little bit here and a little bit there and without too much thought um, behind it. But uh, but there's the same sort of ping pong delay on most of them. So I feel like it sort of tied sounds together mainly with that effect Mm. yeah give everything that's a similar kind of delay treatment yeah uh, exactly yeah awesome yeah and and you're just so you're recording everything in like you know a spare bedroom where where are you doing all these all these recordings everything's been in a bedroom like nothing has been in a treated anything (laughs) and and actually (laughs) my rooms have never been treated either so which is probably not ideal but I don't know like I feel like you know, you can do so much with, with your DAW. Obviously, you know, it, it's, it's best practice to try and get the best recording. But also um, from what I've heard from a lot of um, our podcast guests that are incredible at, at what they do as well, everyone says it's all about the performance and, and how you can get the best performance. And I think a lot of the times for me that's yeah. the first time that I record something and I'm not really overthinking where I am exactly and how to perfectly be in a treated space or whatever. So it's just kind of what comes out. And I've tried recreating that with, with more thought about like 
the mic I'm using or, or where I'm standing or things like that, but then I've lost the performance. So, right. Yeah. So it hasn't really worked. And then I've gone back to the original recording. So, so yeah, so I feel like they, they're good enough for me to work with. Yeah. As long as yeah. the performance is there. Yeah. I, I interviewed somebody named Emia who, uh, um, is also like a self-producing artist. Yeah. And, uh, she said, I just do it in my bedroom with this microphone. Cause this is where I'm most comfortable and I can deliver. Like mm. if I go to a studio, it's not going to be, not going to be the same yeah. performance. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. it's amazing what you can get. Yeah, I guess you got to just be as mindful as you can be when you're when you're tracking and just figure out the best spot in the room. And, you know, I've done a lot of uh, <laughs> recording in in ideal, you know, un, in unideal spaces. And yeah. I find that there there is there are ways to kind of get find the best spot, you know what I mean? Yeah. And like tr- try to get the best spot in that room. Like, you know, I'll like walk around a room and kind of like sing until it sounds like it's resonating nicely or, or mm-hmm. something, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. There, yeah. there are, there's some there's some tricks you can do. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if you've tried any of those like uh, acoustic balls. I don't I don't know if they work. I don't know if that's something that you've used. I haven't used it before, and I've had sort of mixed thoughts about it. Like um, some people have said that it kind of gives it a bit of like a tinny feel or something, depending on maybe which one, which uh, reflection filter or, or whatever that you're using. So, but some people say it's really good. So uh, I guess I, I haven't really given it a shot either way, but I've also felt like the recordings that I've gotten, I've been able to do enough with it to, to kind of get to the result that I want anyway. So if it was something that I was really thinking, oh, like this is a struggle to work with and I, I really wish I had a much, much better sound to start with, then maybe I'd think about it more. But <laughs> I haven't really yeah. given it that much thought, I guess. Yeah, yeah. As long as you're happy with, you know, the you know, the sounds you're getting and yeah. you know, the performances are there. That's the most important thing. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, do you do anything, you know, to help you kind of work faster when you're working on your on your music? Like any kind of things that speed up the process for you or help you work more efficiently? But I think having deadlines always helps. Like having some date that you're gonna tell yourself that you're going to get it done by and having someone to tell those deadlines to <laughs> like a accountability buddy or something, I think really helps. And, and, you know, I'm not really talking DAW specific things um, to do, but uh, more just kind of mental things to keep you on track. But I think that probably helps me more than anything because otherwise you know, everyone has a million unfinished projects and and you kind of start with something and then it's not that shiny and new anymore. And then you just move on to the next thing. So just telling yourself that you're actually going to get this one done by this day or whatever um, helps. But other than that, I, I think I don't really have any tricks to work faster. I mean, like obviously having all your, as many shortcuts, like on your fingertips as possible <laughs> always helps. But uh, yeah, no, no specific kind of tricks, I would say. Yeah, fair enough. And, and in terms of like, just like habits and creative energy, you know, we all have days where we're kind of like super jazzed to get in and work, but there are also days where we're not as excited to get in and, and do our work. How do we, how do you kind of um, uh, stay energized? Do you do any habits? Do you, you know, exercise, whatever it is? I don't know. <laughs> things that kind of help keep you zen. (laughs) Oh yeah. So huge fan of exercise and meditation as well. So I'll, um, I think if I have a good morning, then I'll pretty much have a good day. Um, but when you're, when your morning's kind of all over the place and you, you've just kind of started off badly, then it's hard to course correct to then have a good day. Um, but exercise has been a big thing for me, especially this year. And what I've realized is obviously there's different things that motivate people, but a big one for me that I found out through um, the app called Duolingo to to Mm. learn a new language. And my streak on Duolingo is about 206, sorry, 625 days or something. So like, Oh my gosh. um, So yeah, like getting close to two years and that's what language are you learning? uh, Spanish. (laughs) And I'm still probably terrible, Ah. but I realized streaks really help me to actually keep doing something. So I was like, okay, how can I use this 
um, knowledge about myself to actually build more habits. So I actually got a, an app called Habits and it works in a similar way to what Duolingo does is that it gives me a little checkbox and I have to check it every day. And then I can see that the light stays on, you know, for every day that I've checked it. And I don't want that to go off one day because then I'll just kind of lose track. So I've been creating, uh, you know, a habit on my phone for the meditation for, you know, running and cycling a few times a week. Um, and I've, I've got a number that I need to get to. And so far, you know, we're, we're into February, like all the goals that I've set for me, I've, done them at the interval that I wanted to do them. So, um, that's been a a huge, huge motivator for me. So, so yeah, I guess just finding what it is that will make you keep going. I love that. Um, I, I'm, I'm in the middle of reading atomic habits, which (gasps) I know is like of the culture in this moment for some reason. Um, and, and like, you know, he talks about input goals versus output goals and, you know, everyone's like saying, I want to, you know, lose 50 pounds this year, or I want to, you know, run a marathon. But like, if you say, Hey, I'm going to run for 15 minutes every morning, Mm. that's actually something that you can start to build off of and build habits and, you know, versus I'm going to run a marathon, you know, but so no, true. run 15 minutes. Yeah. And, um, yeah, these are things that I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about. And, um, although to be honest, this, <laughs> the habit app sounds a little stressful to me, but maybe just cause I'm coming from this Jewish background where it's like, you have to pray three times a day and, uh, you know, you have to keep up with all these things and they give you these like, kind of like OCD tendencies. <laughs> so it's kind of, that okay. would maybe like be stressful for me, but anyways, Fair enough. I totally dig it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> of course, you know, not not the same way is going to work for everyone. But um, this was just something that I kind of stumbled on by accident through um, through Duolingo. So um, very cool. So yeah, so it 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 works it works for me, and and I'm sure you you have your own ways um, to do that. Maybe, as well. <laughs> maybe, or or, or not. <laughs> <laughs> or not. That's all good. But, uh, I, you know, one thing I've realized is I can't introduce too many things at once. So like right. now I've kind of, I've kept up with my cycling, running and meditation. So now I'm adding one new one and I plan to do that for the next month and then hopefully add one more. Um, but I think right. sometimes when we get to the start of the year, we're like, oh, I'm going to do these 10 things every day from now, you know, and then impossible it's just too much. And then, yeah. Right. <laughs> I f- it's like you got to get make sure that it turns into a habit first and then you can kind of exactly introduce something new yeah. I guess. Yeah. Exactly. Well, yeah. that's Rome what I'm wasn't built in a day. Anyway. Yes, yeah. true. <laughs> totally. Totally. Yeah. Um so, you know, you you teach a lot of people how to do music production and you you know, this is this is your this is what you do. Uh what what do you f- feel is like a mistake that a lot of people getting started are making and uh maybe, you know, give a a word of wisdom on that and maybe something they could do differently. Sure. So I think, um, overcomplicating is the biggest one or like not even starting is actually the worst one. When people think it's so hard that they don't actually even take the first steps and they're just intimidated by the gear, the, the software and everything. But so what I try to tell people, you know, a lot is that, all you need is uh, a laptop, a pair of headphones and some sort of software, um, you know, and, and you can use a, a free thing like GarageBand, whatever it is that you have available to you and just start there and then build as you go. But I think some people start, maybe they go out and buy a bunch of gear, but they don't actually know what they need or if they even need it. Um, and then they're just overwhelmed by having a bunch of new things that they don't know how to use. So I would say slowly build your studio, just start with what you have and then add things one at a time, depending on what you, what you need and, and don't buy the most expensive and high spec thing that you could buy because it might just be overwhelming um, rather than actually getting you excited to use it. Yeah. I love that. That's a, that's a great piece of advice. I feel like Something that I've been thinking about is is that, you know, when you need to upgrade, it's it's like, bl- you know, blatantly obvious, you know, <laughs> it's just like, oh, there is a reason why I'm not under, you know, my mid-range isn't translating. Now I need new monitors, mm. but it took me seven years to get to this point, you know, or wh- however long, you know. So, like, I feel like 
it's it's important to kind of just use what you have until you know for a fact, and it's so obvious that it's time to upgrade. And uh, yeah. so I love that. So- 